Hello and welcome to Conservation Matters. I'm Shane Mahoney and I have dedicated my life to the conservation of wild animals and wild places. I invite you to join me as I explore the science, the issues and the challenges impacting global conservation in the 21st century. Together we will seek solutions and together we can affect change. Conservation, after all, is everybody's business. One natural world, one humanity, one chance. Conservation matters. To learn more, please visit conservationvisions.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So, um, we have a rock star in the room, and uh, he recently did a concert in... Uh, Nanaimo and, I, and he's losing his voice because he's so popular. <clears throat> Some people confuse him with Moses, but he is. Uh, but he does talk like a fire and brimstone. He's a he's a wealth of knowledge. He's the founder and CEO of Conservation Visions, um, and um, really uh, sets the bar really high as far as uh, his uh, communication and efforts that he helps uh, GOABC. Uh, take us to the next level for conservation and sustainable use. You'll see uh, Shane Mahoney's imprint in a lot of things that GOABC does. We talked this morning about our support for the Wild Harvest Initiative. Uh, you heard us talk this morning about uh, that conservation matters and Shane's help with the uh, grizzly bear, bear paper. You see him in Mountain Hunter. You see him in um, Sports of Field. You see him in the Dallas Safari Club. Uh, he's got a very good message. He's a very long-term thinker. And uh, we're very proud to have him in the room. So uh, uh, Shane Mahoney, if you would come to this stage. Is... We live in a world where we sometimes believe we'll never be surprised anymore. We've seen so much. And then, in one of the great cities of the world, in one of the great zoos of the world, human beings jump over a barrier, shoot a rhinoceros three times in the head, saw off its face with a chainsaw, and make their getaway before they're able to kill another two animals. That reality sounds like something a person would make up, but that reality only happened a week ago, and it's taking place in exactly the same world where there is a rising, measurable rising of empathy for animals worldwide, and a rising tension over the issues of hunting and the sustainable use of wildlife. It's easy to understand why the publics of the world are confused, because they open up their paper at one point and it says that people are opposed to the hunting of lions or something of this nature. They open up their paper and they see a major demonstration on behalf of animals somewhere in the world, and then they open up their paper and somebody is saying that, well, the sustainable use of wildlife is a really good thing, and then they open up their paper and there's a group of people jumping fences in the Paris Zoo to shoot an animal in captivity and saw its face off. So if there's one thing we ought to be able to come together on, it seems to me, is an understanding of why our issues are as complicated as they are, why publics, governments, citizens are confused as they are about issues, and why it's completely naive of us to believe that all we have to do is put our hands in the air and say, we who are involved in the sustainable use of wildlife are good people, and therefore you all ought to listen to us. So my first request here today, in this last of many lectures since the 3rd of January, is to 
ask us all to at least come to this discussion this afternoon with a level of moderation and a level of willingness to try to understand one another. There is no doubt whatsoever that the empathy for animals is rising worldwide. I have the ability, the, the opportunity, uh, to engage in discussions on many issues surrounding wildlife around this globe. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, in my own heart at least, that there is a rising concern for the health and well-being of wild creatures. Some will say that it is not that deep, that it is frivolous, and in some cases they will say it is opportunistic because some of the people and organizations espousing it are against hunting. I would also ask you to please understand that that is not true. There are some people, of course, who are deeply opposed to the activities that many of the people in this room not only are engaged in but make their living with. But the truth of the matter is that many people in society are separated from the death of animals by a long, long distance, <clears throat> have never experienced it firsthand, certainly have never been responsible for the death of any animal they consume, and as a result of that are coming to a point of simply being fascinated with animals without understanding in any deep, emotional, or direct way that animals die to feed us and that we are part of an inevitable food chain and equation that no amount of rhetoric, no amount of passion, no amount of idealism, no amount of ideology is ever going to be changed, is ever going to change. But that doesn't change the fact <clears throat> that we have to figure out how to work within a modern society. And please note my emphasis on modern. We have to figure out, policymakers in government, people in the business of the outdoor business, whether it is a business such as Sitka has or whether it's a, uh, an NGO community like the GOABC or the Wild Sheep Foundation, all of us have to realize that that is the world we are working in, living in, making our business in, whether your business is the marketing of ideas, or whether your business is the marketing of outdoor clothing, whether your business is the marketing of conservation of a particular species, we are operating in a modern world. And wanting the world to be something we create in our minds or that represented our past is not an effective way to move in my personal view, our businesses, in quotation marks, forward, and it is not the way that we are going to be effective in the conservation of wildlife. That means that for those of us who believe in a certain approach to conservation, such as through sustainable use, let's say, we have to find a way to make our message resonate with the modern world. We may think that the efforts of the European Union to ban all imports of hunted species from anywhere around the world is a concoction of a small faction of crazies who are opposed to hunting worldwide, and that all of these highly educated, multilingual European parliamentarians have had some kind of lobotomy and have lost their minds and simply have had their fe heads filled with drivel. That's fine, believe it, if one wishes to. The truth of the matter is that those politicians in those circumstances are responding to a modern public that has a diverse view of the world that in some cases encompasses what we believe and in many cases encompasses a completely different view of the world altogether. The point is that what we wish to achieve has to be achieved in that realistic world, that realistic circumstance. In British Columbia, the public has diverse views on certain issues surrounding hunting, for example. Let's take grizzly bears because it is the most 
widely known of these debates, the most high profile at the present moment. We know this diversity exists even within our own midst, even within our own states, and within our own provinces. By the way, please also agree with me that these debates around these issues are not bifurcated between those who hunt and those who don't hunt. Because I can assure you there is tremendous diversity of opinion around hunting issues within the hunting community. And there is tons of empirical evidence to indicate this. So let us assume for the moment that we are sort of all together in a very complicated modern world where all of our desires for progress and our viewpoints have to sort of fight their way through. Now our idea is that the conservation of wildlife and the sustainable use of wildlife are legitimate activities. They are traditional, historic, they still matter, they still resonate. That is our view because we come from that world. We were fed on that breast. That was our nourishment of our view of the world. That's where it came from. But the truth of the matter is that our idea is now facing really significant challenge. And we can continue to battle one-on-one -on -one like two rams against opposing forces in society, turn ourselves and smash our heads together and then twist our horns to say, see, this is how big and powerful I am. We can continue to do that and we can watch the same patterns of change take place. Because we are not going to turn off the growth of cities. We are not going to turn off the growth of empathy for wildlife. Because young Chinese today feel vastly different than their parents. And it's certainly not the responsibility or the, 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 the benefit, for want of a better term, of anti-hunting groups teaching them to be so. It is because of a broad social change. So in my world of conservation and in my world of promoting hunting and the sustainable use of wildlife and fish and all natural resources for that matter, I feel we need to do two things. We need to build coalitions of strength instead of silos of weakness. And we need to find landing pads for our ideas in a modern society, a society that looks like the society I spoke to last night in Nanaimo, where people at 21 years of age were asking me questions and prefacing it with, you know, when I was younger, <laughs> I told them, you've just hatched, you know. I mean, <laughs> when I was younger, we need to find a way for our ideas to resonate with those people for two reasons. One is because we believe in this. I believe in the conservation of wildlife. I believe it's the most important task in the world. I don't believe there's anything more complicated. I don't think there's anything more honorable to give your life for. Nothing in my, in my worldview. I also believe it's the most complicated business in the world because it is the interface of politics and human traditions, lifestyles, planetary ecology, and our own desires for natural resources, our population growth. Please don't expect any elected official in any government in the world to be an expert in this because to be an expert in this takes a lifetime of study. We have this complicated world. We have to find a way for our ideas to come forward because we believe in them. And we have to come forward with our ideas because we do not see alternatives for the conservation of wildlife. But also, if we are interested in keeping the hunting and angling traditions alive in our society, and particularly hunting, this is true of, 
but increasingly it is also true of fishing. And you can deny the statistics, anybody can. We can cover our eyes, you know, we can be like children. We can put our hands over our eyes and say, you know, we won't see anything, there's nothing bad out there because I can't see it. But the truth of the matter is that in this snake of the hunting world, there is a great big lump. And that big lump is people between the ages of 55 and 85. And that big lump is going to pass its way along that snake, and that big lump is going to pass out the other end. That big lump is going to disappear. And if we don't soon find something to significantly replace that big lump, you know that your children will not inherit businesses like yours. And every year that passes, this issue becomes more significant. Oh, it's not only significant in British Columbia. It is significant across Canada. It is significant across the United States of America. And because Africa is hunted fundamentally by people from the United States of America and some from Canada, it's also deeply influential on what happens in hunting on that continent, which is already, which is already under immense challenge. So we need to do something, ladies and gentlemen, to be prepared for that lump in the snake. Now, we have tried in Canada and the United States for 25 years, and I opened some of the very first hunter retention and recruitment programs launched in the United States of America, which were launched well ahead of whatever happened in Canada. And after spending, some estimate 100 million, some estimate 150 million, we have not seen the recruitment and retention to hunting that anybody hoped for or planned for. But we have spent all of that money, it is gone, trying to build hunter retention and recruitment programs that would mimic how we grew up. Uncle Jack taking me out there, you know, across the land to do a little bit of hunting. My, my neighbor across the street saying, yes, boy, come on, go on hunting here, no problem whatsoever. I know there's a couple of moose hanging down there at the edge of that droke of woods. You should go down there and take them. The world is gone. It's gone in Newfoundland, it's gone in British Columbia, it's gone in South Carolina, it's gone pretty well everywhere. And so we failed. And we could be sitting here in what might be a terribly hopeless circumstance, except that out of nowhere, out of nowhere, seemingly, and certainly not out of our hunter retention and recruitment programs, we see a renaissance. It's not big enough yet to replace that lump in the snake, but we see a renaissance happening for hunting. The first real sign of true, realistic optimism in my experience in 30 years. And where is it coming from? It's coming from young males and young women between the ages of 25 and 40 who are coming into hunting for completely different reasons or some very different reasons than all of you. They're coming in like Mark Zuckerberg. He's got a few dollars to throw around. Got a little bit of influence, seeing he runs Facebook. Comes to deer hunting in his life because he wants to take responsibility for the meat that he consumes. We have young men and women joining it because they are afraid of the food they are getting. They don't know where it comes from. They want it to be organic, and they want to take responsibility for their food. And they're also in love with the imagery displayed in the, with the marketing finesse of groups like Sitka and so forth, of people in the mountains, people fit, people strong, people out there. They're not coming for our world. They're coming for a modern world. Ideas are like pollinators or jet 
aircraft at sea. To be successful, they have to find a landing pad in society. We can keep up this battering ram of trying to force our ideas into a modern conscience, or we can look at the modern conscience and find our way in. Now, when the Boston states, the fishermen of the Boston states, invented the schooner, they found a way to take sails that were this way across a ship headed that way and put them in line. You know, we were sailing for century after century after century doing that and believing that all we had to do was improve that kind of architecture to get a better and better and better ship. And suddenly, some guy sitting at the edge of a pier said, you know what? Why don't we look at birds and how they use the wind? And what about we put our sails this way and could adjust them to take advantage of even crosswinds? They sailed with the realities of the world, and they transformed maritime travel, trade, and commerce. In my search for a relevant thing for hunting and for wildlife, I seek a modern relevance in a way that makes sense in a modern world. For 25 to 30 years, I reviewed every single resource development plan in Newfoundland and Labrador that had any impact on wildlife resources. And I can tell you, as is often the case in British Columbia, as is often the case everywhere in the world, the value placed on those wildlife resources was less than the value placed upon the minerals, the oil, the hydropower, the timber, or whatever other resource was out there. For 25 years, I witnessed that. And now that I'm out of government, I'm seeing it everywhere else in the world. We need to find ways to value wildlife more. And out of this same cauldron where there is hope for a renewed energy for hunting and angling in our modern society, there is the hope that we can give people a new idea about how valuable wildlife is. And both of those things go back to the very origins of our history as human beings. And both of them, we now are being told by 100-mile diets, table-to-kitchen platforms, organic food movements, fitness crazes on the part of people who eventually must be going to die of nothing because they're in such great shape. All of that is telling us that we have a special weapon. And the special weapon is food. Everyone cares for it. Everyone is concerned about it. Everybody needs it. So in this complicated world of tensions and rising empathy for wildlife and concern for our health and our fitness and all of those things, we see phenomena such as vegans saying, we have broken the code of no meat, but only in the case where this is wildlife harvested from the land. We are seeing a growth in the interest of wild food that is an absolute phenomenon. We are seeing chefs turned into rock stars. We are seeing chefs that cook gay meat turned into super rock stars. And we are seeing all these young people with earrings in their ears and purple streaks through their hair and going hunting. So, about two years ago, I conceived of an idea. I asked myself, how much food 
do the people who hunt and fish in Canada and the United States actually gather onto themselves? Because we are the local, we are the original locavore, of course, right? We just started it all, but we didn't know, and nobody else knew. So I asked myself, how much? And I looked for the answer, and there was no answer. I asked myself, has anybody ever tried to put together all of the information on all of the wild meat and fish harvested by the 40 to 45 to 50 million, 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 listen to this, 45 to 50 million people in Canada and the United States who take place every year in those activities. Surely the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, surely the Canadian Wildlife Service, surely the state agencies, surely the provincial agencies, surely somebody who had done this. The answer, never. Was it ever done? So, in partnership with quite a number of organizations, including businesses, state agencies, NGOs, such as Guides and Outfitters of British Columbia, very forward-looking conservation-minded organizations like Sitka, the Wild Sheep Foundation, and others. We have launched this Wild Harvest Initiative, and I'm going to tell you what it is because you will hear about it if you haven't already. We are going to compile every piece of information on the harvest of these species, fish and wildlife, in the 69 political jurisdictions in Canada and the United States, and this is well underway. We are going to build the first database that has ever incorporated all of this information. When we bring together the total number of animals and fish harvested by all of these people in society, we are going to calculate the gross biomass of that harvest by the average body weights of those particular species. We are then going to work with people who are experienced in agriculture, in butchering and so on, and with hunters and anglers themselves, and the people who service them, to come up with the net biomass. How much of all of that gross biomass do we actually consume? Then we are going to work with economists to give us an absolute fair market value. Not this back of the envelope thing that hunting organizations do all the time. You know, well, I believe beef spells for such and such, therefore this is worth this. No, we're going to go to economists and say, here's a commodity, you tell us what elk is worth. And we will do that for every species hunted. And then we are going to have the biomass of organic food harvested by a community of people in Canada and the United States that includes bankers and lawyers and, and, and truck drivers and fishermen and, and grad students at university and academics and oncologists from UBC Hospital and all these places. We're going we're to present all that as a food procurement model that is quite likely the largest environmentally friendly food procurement system in the world. And then, then we are going to calculate the sharing index for that food in our society because it is all about relevance, ladies and gentlemen. It is all about relevance, not about making you feel good. We know that conservatively, every hunter and fisherman shares their catch or their kill with at least four people. Now, we think that's conservative because we know there's a disease in the hunting world called sharing. And as soon as you kill something, you feel the need to share it. You go to the grocery store and buy your chicken, and you feel it is all yours. You don't go to your friend or your relative and buy them a roast from the grocery store and say, knock on the door, I have just brought you a prime rib. But as soon as that animal's down, most of us are thinking, soon as it's, the knife is laid down, 
and it starts to peel away from the breastbone, that amazing sound, the tearing of tissue, we're already thinking about, well, I need to give my brother some of that. I'm going to have a barbecue, and I'm going to have everybody over for the ribs. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. We share this food, this 50 million of us, with at least 200 or 250 million people out of two countries that now have 360 million people in them. And it might be more. And we've never told the story because we never bloody well knew the answer. We preferred to constantly fight one another, to break down the possibility of coalitions. We're going to calculate that sharing index and we're going to explain what that means. And then we're going to go two steps further. We're going to take those billions of pounds, billions of pounds of totally organic food. We are going to combine that with the economic data that already exists on hunting and angling to show for the first time the entire economic value of harvested wildlife in Canada and the United States. And then we're going to go further still. We're going to do what we call the counterfactual. We're going to say, OK, here is what's currently happening. 50 million people legally engaged in these activities, providing a significant, in some cases a disproportionate, amount of support for the conservation of wildlife and fish. The people who argue for keeping wildlife habitat intact, not destroying it. The people who go and harvest their food without leaving major footprints on the land. The people who pay for the opportunity to do that, who let's share all of that with friends, neighbors, and families in their communities, and with the homeless, and with the disadvantaged. And then we're going to say, OK, it's over. We're throwing it down. We're going to give up on this. Now we want someone to tell us what it's going to cost in terms of money, wildlife habitat lost, carbon footprint input, to raise that amount of organic, organic protein with modern industrial agriculture. We will have graduate students pursuing in-depth aspects. We have already built the database and are populating it. We will have companies hired to mobilize this data because what we are creating is a knowledge reservoir for journalists, for politicians, for policy makers, for NGOs, for graduate students, for everyone. A knowledge reservoir out of which run streams that form deltas to bring this knowledge to a more wider and wider and wider public on an issue that we already know they are deeply concerned about. On an issue that they agree with us on. For 60 years we have known that the broad public supports our activities when it is done legally and when it is done in significant purpose being, or a major purpose being, to bring the food back and consume that animal. We don't have to convince them of that, ladies and gentlemen. That's the landing pad. They're already there. We don't have to convince them that this is the most organic food in the world. The vegan community is telling them that. And the values we express, the sharing. We live in a world where the good values of humanity are being sought out every day more and more because we see Syria, we see Africa. 
we have this extraordinary, this extraordinary drama to lay out in a beautiful way that is acceptable to everyone. And along that way, we are going to create the widest coalitions possible. So we have corporations that are helping us. We already have state governments helping us. We are hoping that we are moving towards the possibility of an arrangement in British Columbia through HCTF and perhaps other means, we hope. We have private citizens who are supporting us. There is a meeting being planned with John Morris. If you don't know who Johnny Morris is, Johnny Morris is the man who owns Bass Pro and Cabela's, and he was just one of the architects of the Blue Ribbon Panel on developing new conservation funding mechanisms for the United States of America, amongst many, many other things that that amazing man has done. We want to have people in the fitness community. The Northern Chefs Alliance has been in touch with us. We are speaking to the people at Yeti. Lou Poland Stevens, the optics company. And you will see some brochures around your table that will show you already the list of partners, but there are many more because some that are already in are not listed. They will come out in the next update. And I will tell you something else. This project, because of its relevance to food security, and let us not think that Canada and the United States are not having their own problems with food security. Many of you live in communities that have no more than seven to ten days food. If you don't believe that, read the statistics on your own government websites. The United States of America is, uh, has got half the aquifers in the Central Valley of California already drained of water, never to be replaced. We have our own food security issues. But because of that issue, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the United Nations legitimate environmental arm, arguably the largest and certainly the most influential conservation organization in the world, has become a full partner. You see their logo on those brochures with this project and have identified it as one of the projects for delivery in their next four-year plan of work. That's how relevance is gained, ladies and gentlemen. That's how we bring the legitimacy of hunting and angling to the world. That's how we make politicians realize they can work with us without being feared. That's how we can convince society from the people like Mark Zuckerberg all the way to the man who's 85, who's hunted all his life in rural Newfoundland, see the world on this platform in the same way. Some have called it the best thing to ever happen for the retention and recruitment of hunters that they've ever seen. I don't believe in silver bullets, but this is going to change the narrative on hunting and angling in the most significant way that anything has in the last 50 years. I am totally, absolutely convinced of this. And we have partners such as Sitka that have already talked about using their enormous machine to help us spread this out. The Elk Foundation, which is a supporter, have offered their new platform to do the same. We are reaching out to companies now who specialize in developing strategies for communicating large bodies of knowledge to the world. I have done interviews with The Guardian in Britain. They already know about it. That is coming out in the most influential uh, newspaper in Britain in another week. We're doing interviews with lots of others in Canada and the United States. There's talk of a film has been talked about with regard to this. We will get all those chefs, you know, that everybody's in love with. What's his name, O'Dane? What's this guy's name goes around the world? Eating crazy stuff. My sisters are in love with him. I don't know. What's his? You all know who he is anyway. He's got a, t a television show. We're going to get that guy in. We're going to be hosting dinners in major cities in the United States and Canada. We're already planning our first one. And we're going to invite the chief of police. And we're going to invite the mayor. And we're going to invite the chief of the fire department. 
and we're going to lay out this game. And we're going to say what we stand for is the land and waters that produce this for our countries. And we disproportionately pay to make sure that happens. And we never exclude anybody from this repast. Anyone, any citizen can come and join this. And we are the priests of knowledge around this. We will show you how. This is a brand new story. This is not the story of 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago. This is the new game. Hmm? This is the new invention. This is the new narrative that all nations have to develop eventually, that all businesses have to develop eventually. And this is the new narrative for us. And remember, a rising tide floats all boats. So for those who are most concerned about issues such as trophy hunting, which forms the great and most intense debate issue in the hunting realm, understand that as we rise in general acceptance, as we rise in a broader view and understanding of the benefits of hunting, all forms of hunting will derive benefits from it. But for the vast majority who have as part of their objective to bring home proudly to their family and friends proof of their capacity to engage in our oldest triad life as predators in the natural world, for all of those people, this is a main line shot of adrenaline right into the main arteries. I want to thank the people who made this possible because when this was just a raw little idea looking for faith in the beginning, we had the Dallas Safari Club and the Wild Sheep Foundation and the guides and outfitters of British Columbia come to the table like horses breaking out of a corral onto new spring pasture. And it's because those groups came in first that we were able to make the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. As Brian said today in his address about the Habitat Conservation Trust Fund, the initial investments made by this organization and others who were concerned about the state of wildlife in this province enabled the now very diverse funding mechanisms for that institution in the province of British Columbia. Well, this long-term study that is going to do so much to help us, let's not forget we're launched by people who in the very beginning stood up and said, I will have faith and I will make an effort and I will support this. And I can assure the guides and outfitters of British Columbia and the Wild Sheep Foundation and Sitka and Dallas Safari Club and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and Whitetails Unlimited uh, and the state of Florida and Quality Deer Management Association and all the others that you see listed on the back of that brochure that I will not forget what they have given. We are already beginning to mobilize this data and within another six to eight months, I can assure you that the largest assemblage of data in this, of this kind ever, ever developed in the world will reside in this database that we have now built. Thank you.